Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, news and comment. It's Monday, April 8th, 2019. Your humble host wants to alert you that I have a scheme in mind. I'm declaring Wednesday a ski day, perhaps my final one of this season. So plan accordingly. Here's the news that you didn't hear from the corporate media over the weekend. Trump has declared himself above the law. In essence. And we'll get to the firing of uh, the Kirsten Nielsen at Homeland Security, the head of the Secret Service, and other antics in a moment. But the corporate media has blacked out coverage of the critical decisions that have been issued first by a trial court and then by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, declaring that Trump's original issuance of a so-called presidential permit to force through the approval of construction of the Keystone XL pipeline was not legal. And in the face of those court rulings and a likely appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, on March 29th, the Trump administration fulfilled a prediction made by Stephen Volcker, the attorney who represents the lead plaintiffs in the case that won the injunction against construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. Steve Volcker, who's based in Berkeley, gave me an interview that's currently available at Who, What, Why, and uh, we'll be posting it here at my website and my network later this week. And Steve Volker, in that interview, predicted that on appeal, the Trump administration and TransCanada would assert that the president has the unassailable authority to issue such a permit. Now, that is not grounded in the law. The trial court and the appeals court did not rule in favor of the president's blanket authority that is beyond the review of the courts. And so, instead of preparing for the appeal to the Supreme Court, the Trump administration, in a regal breach of constitutionality, simply issued a new presidential permit. Now, I learned of this on Friday, April 5th. But there was zero coverage that I saw during the period between the March 29th issuance of this new presidential permit. And I know about this because Steve Volcker has filed a new lawsuit challenging Trump's decision to approve a second presidential permit without conducting the additional environmental reviews that the federal courts have previously ordered. So this is breathtaking. Not only that Trump would take this step, but the media thinks this is so insignificant. And sure, you know, they've got to cover his tweets and the bloodbath at Homeland Security and many other of his distracting antics. But I consider this very significant. Meanwhile, heads up Joey Perillo. He's one of our listeners and subscribers who lives near Philadelphia. His governor, the Democrat Tom Wolf, is under fire. As internal documents obtained by Britain's Guardian newspaper, and this is where I value their investigative reporting here in the United States. I didn't see this from the Times, the Post, or even one of the left independent media outlets in this country. So the issues relate to whether Tom Wolf intervened and overrode his environmental agency to approve the application by Texas-based Energy Transfer Partners. They're the fine folks who are building the Dakota Access Pipeline. Well, the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania was in the middle of an environmental review. They had circulated two deficiency letters they were planning to issue to the pipeline's subsidiary, Sunoco Logistics. But they got an email from a woman in the governor's office whose husband is an oil and gas lobbyist. A former. A former 
oil and gas lobbyist. And five days later, there were meetings. And two weeks after that, the Department of Environmental Protection approved the pipeline without requiring many of the environmental safeguards that it had initially insisted on. And about a month ago, March 12th, Pennsylvania's Attorney General and the District Attorney of Delaware County announced a joint criminal investigation of the pipeline and the company. A bipartisan group of 14 state legislators have signed a letter to Wolf requesting that he issue a moratorium on both of the existing Mariner East pipelines. Now, the construction of the pipeline has already resulted in more than 80 uh, environmental violations. The DEP has uh, issued more than $13 million in penalties against the company. And Wolf is trying to dissemble, in my opinion. First, a statement from his office. Decisions around the permits and any conditions were made by the Department of Environmental Protection. A previous public statement by Wolf indicates he went beyond seeking updates from the agency. I asked them what their timetable was, and then I said, let's do it. As a CEO, I was the same way. You say you're going to do something, let's get it done. <laughs> now, what might motivate Governor Wolf? Well, he's gotten substantial donations from companies with a financial stake in the Mariner East 2 including 20 grand toward his 2018 election campaign from a gas producer, EQT Corp. And he received a million and a half in campaign contributions in his past campaign, 2014, from individuals and PACs tied to the oil and gas industry. Something is rotten in Pennsylvania, and I hope you can clean it up pronto. One of the big stories we continue to watch over the weekend was the fate of Julian Assange. And at this hour, which is uh, after 2 p.m. Pacific time on Monday the 8th, he is still reported to be living in the embassy. Now, we reported last week, based on great coverage by Consortium News, that part of Assange's current problems relate to controversies and scandals in Ecuador where the president, Lenin Moreno, has been accused of corruption based on leaked documents from a Panamanian company called INA. And so he reflexively uh, looked at a leak and said, well, that came from WikiLeaks. And as we reported, he blamed Assange and he blamed Nicolas Maduro, the leader of Venezuela, for some sort of a conspiracy that is apparent to absolutely no one else but Lenin Moreno. And today we've learned that Ecuador has sacked an official from the London embassy who was accused of having a close rapport with Julian Assange. We don't have a name for the individual, only that uh, he was removed. This comes as Moreno is facing massive protests in Ecuador based on a report from an Ecuadorian journalist, Jose Rivera, who appeared uh, alongside me and many other uh, advocates for Assange during the weekend-long vigil that was available uh, through links at consortiumnews.com. And Craig Murray, the former ambassador from Britain to uh, was a former Soviet state like Azerbaijan, he is a close colleague of Julian Assange. He's the one who said he picked up the DNC leaks on a flash drive at American University and took them to London. So he writes that he spent the last three days on his own vigil outside the embassy. He says, plainly, Julian's position has deteriorated fundamentally to the extent he is now treated openly as a closely guarded prisoner. And he says he has not been granted to uh, permission to visit him in recent weeks. And he says nothing has happened. He predicted that 4 a.m. Monday would be the moment when the British police might pounce, and that has come and gone. But he offers this advice. When Julian does leave the embassy, whatever the circumstances, it'll be for a day or two the largest media story in the world and will lead all the news bulletins across every major country. The odds are he will be leaving and face a fight against extradition to the United States 
on charges arising from the Chelsea Manning releases, which revealed a huge amount about U.S. war crimes and other illegal acts. It will be very important to try to focus a hostile media on why it is Julian is actually wanted for extradition. Not for the non-existent collusion with Russia to assist Trump. Not for meetings with Paul Manafort, which never happened. Not for the allegations in Sweden, which fell apart immediately when they were subject to rational scrutiny. And not for any nonsense about whether he hacked the communications in the embassy or cleaned up the cat litter. <laughs> this is not going to be an easy task, Murray continues because pretty well all the Western media is going to want to focus on the false anti-Assange narratives. It is a classic and fundamental issue of freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Drawing together a team that can get this message across is an important task. And he calls on allies of Assange to prepare. So I mentioned the purge at Homeland Security. After two years of kissing Trump's butt, and implementing and defending indefensible policies, Kirsten Nielsen has submitted her resignation. Now, this is only a rumor that I heard from the right-wing <laughs> radio host Rush Limbaugh. And he says that when Nielsen went to the White House late yesterday, Trump ordered her to close the Mexican border and other unknown orders that she refused, saying they were not legal. Now, it took her two years to get there. She first said there was no family separation policy as a way of defending this, uh, again, indefensible move that is mostly blamed on Jeff Sessions. But Nielsen has soiled herself in so many ways, it's hard to count them all. So... Today, Trump continued the purge, calling for the resignation of the director of the Secret Service, Randolph Alice, A-L-L-E-S, never heard of the guy, John Mitnick, DHS General Counsel, and Francis Cisna, that's the male Francis, the head of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Now, there is a new pick for the Secret Service, James M. Murray, a career official in that agency, but the speculation is that these people had to go because of their ties to John Kelly, the former chief of staff and who was the Homeland Security director who promoted Nielsen when he moved over to the White House. And all of this is driven by Stephen Miller, the very dark, brooding architect of Trump's <laughs> indescribable immigration policies. Now, Nielsen, as we told you, went to Central America, made what she described as a good deal with the Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. And two days later, Trump trashed it. And he even compounded it by cutting uh, the limited amount of uh, aid that the United States provides to those three countries. So the only question is, why did it take so long? Nielsen threatened to quit last year after being overridden by Trump on another issue. And so <laughs> uh, it's hard to feel sorry for her. And in an editorial at the New York Times, they do a pretty good job of describing her failures. She was the face of some of the administration's most poorly conceived and gratuitously callous policies. At best, she was complicit and, yes, hopelessly weak. And Nancy Pelosi, speaker, said it is deeply alarming that the Trump administration official who put children in cages is reportedly resigning because she is not extreme enough for the White House's liking. And Trump loves to fill these positions with acting interim leaders. And he once uh, told the reporters this past January, I like acting. Now, we're not referring to his reality TV show or <laughs> what he does playing president. We're talking about acting administrators. It gives me more flexibility. Do you understand that? I like acting. So we have a few that are acting. We have a great, great cabinet. 
Now, we currently have an acting Secretary of Defense, an acting Secretary of the Interior, an acting Director of Office of Management and Budget, the Small Business Administration, the Ambassador at the United Nations, and the list goes on. There are many unfilled positions in this administration, and it gives Trump greater leverage to force people to do what he wants. So Trump announced that uh, Kevin McAleenan, currently Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, will be the acting Homeland Security Secretary, and we'll see if he moves to seek Senate confirmation for his new interim acting director of DHS. Last week, I screened a new documentary. It's called The Brink, and it was produced by Allison Clayman, who directs it, and she also uh, appears off camera in some scenes. It is a profile of Steve Bannon, and it is mostly about the things that he has done since he left the White House. Now, there's some fascinating disclosures about Bannon. He permitted this uh, camera crew to follow him quite a bit, although they make it clear when he said, you go, out, you go outside now, I'm going to talk to this guy. And we learn that he knows that he's fat and ugly. <laughs> he defines the difference between his brand of populism and the elitists of the Republican Party. He spends a lot of time talking about the deplorables. Whenever he goes to speak to a group, whether it was in Alabama to endorse Roy Moore or when he goes to Europe to promote far-right political movements, well, he likes to refer to his base, his fans, as the deplorables. And while the film does give us interesting aspects of uh, the Brexit team and Nigel Farage, it is frustrating in the way it fails to make any reference to what Bannon did in the White House, at least not to any significant degree. We don't see Stephen Miller, the dark architect of the immigration policies that I referred to a moment ago. And we don't hear anything about Cambridge Analytica. Now, I realize that happened before he came to the White House. But the film fails to really draw any judgments or conclusions. It's just a kind of neutral look at Mr. Bannon today. So it's produced by Allison Clayman. It's called The Brink. You might find it at a nearby theater soon. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. And let's see who's on the list today. Joe Carson in Tennessee. Jeff Ratner just renewed his annual subscription. Thank you, Jeff. Also, Cliff Johnson and Candace Brunlinger renewed her annual subscription. I appreciate your support however you decide to contribute. And I invite new subscribers to sign up today. Visit PeterBCollins.com, click on Menu, then click on Become a Subscriber. When you're on the sign-up page, you can choose $5, 10 $20 a month. Our $50 annual subscription earns you a bonus book. And that includes a choice of either Trump on the Couch by Dr. Justin Frank or our new offering, the $55 book that is a blueprint for adaptation to climate change. It's called 2100. And I think Jeff Ratner actually signed up for a new subscription, and he requested that book. Jeff, it's on the way to you in the next few days. And I have more copies, so if you take out a new annual subscription, that is one of your choices for a bonus book here at PeterBCollins.com. And I'm releasing a fresh in-depth interview today to all my subscribers, that's at PeterBCollins.com, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, and Stitcher. And Trevor Aronson returns. He wrote the book about the domestic terrorism cases, many of which were manufactured by the FBI, and its, its a cadre of 15,000 paid informants. He's been writing at The Intercept for a couple of years now, and in the podcast interview, we review two of his recent postings. Lengthy magazine-style uh, articles. One, talking about how the government often describes domestic crimes as terrorism, but doesn't actually prosecute them that way. How 
a range of law enforcement officials demand new laws to deal with domestic terrorism. But I believe, and Aronson、uh, I think does too, that they are using that to distract us from the failures of the FBI to follow, investigate, and prosecute. White nationalist groups and other extremists in the United States who don't happen to be brown or Muslim. And as you listen to the podcast and if you read the lengthy article, understand that Aronson is practicing his role as a journalist, and he does present the arguments for and then offers strong arguments against. And you'll hear when I press him that he aligns with my points of view. But that doesn't、uh, poison the work that he does as a journalist.、Uh, a lot of my previous work in looking at the the investigation and prosecution of、um, Muslims in international terrorism cases, an FBI agent, you know, made a comment to me that you know if you if you go to look to find things in a certain place, you'll find a lot of those things. And and what he meant was that you know if you assigned a bunch of in, investigators or agents to look for terrorism in In Muslim communities, you'll find those things. That's just the nature of how it works. That you know, in some cases, that might result in cases that you think are trumped up. But you know, in any case, you know, whether it's terrorism or any sort of crime, if the police dedicate a bunch of undercovers to go look for stuff, they'll find people that can prosecute. And and so when you look at kind of the disparity in the number of international terrorism cases compared to domestic ones, you know, I think you can find. Plenty of FBI agents will tell you that a big part of that is the disparity in the number of agents assigned to investigate those things,、um, and and certainly you know historically if you look at how the FBI treated domestic terrorism in the last you know 15 years or so you know going back to the 2000s you know white white supremacy and neo Nazi violence were not something. You know the FBI really mentioned as as being a, a considerable threat. You know, in fact, they were at the time talking about you know and it, you know so called eco terrorists or radical environmentalists、mm-hmm. that you know are groups like part of the Earth Liberation Front as being the number one domestic terrorism threat. And they were saying that up and through about till two thousand nine. Um, you know, and then the other thing that's worth noting now is that there there has been this clear shift in public sentiment about concern among. Um, you know, white nationalist and neo-Nazi violence due to、um, you know due to things like the United States Right rally, due to kind of a number of cases, including those involving Adam Waffen.、Um, and I think what you're seeing is the FBI now trying to kind of reset the narrative a bit through these you know testimonies that that Christopher Ray has given to say like, no, look, we're we're on top of this. We're investigating it. Like international terrorism, that's still a threat, but don't worry, we haven't you know taken our eye off the domestic terrorism ball. So I encourage you to check that out. We also discuss another article that he recently published about a man named Michael Hari, and he led a group of、uh, extremists based in Illinois. At one point, he submitted a ten、uh, or eleven billion dollar proposal to build the southern border wall, and he postures as the leader of a group with this remarkable name. The White Rabbit Three Percent Illinois Patriot Freedom Fighters Militia, and if you、uh, click through the article, you'll find some videos that they posted wearing ski masks, asking other militias to come to their rescue.、Uh, these are some interesting stories, and I think it's important to look at some of the failures of the FBI when it comes to so-called domestic terrorism prosecutions. And their desire to use the flimsy standard of material support to win convictions. Now, speaking of white nationalist groups, Facebook has issued another ban. This time, it affects Faith Goldie, who is an elected official in Canada, the Soldiers of Odin, the Canadian Nationalist Front, the Wolves of Odin. Gosh, why is Odin such a white,、uh, a white? White hater zone, and the Aryan Strike Force. Now you just hear some of these names, and you say, "Well, I'm not going to miss that in my Facebook feed." And in making the announcement, Facebook says individuals and organizations who spread hate, attack, 
or call for the exclusion of others on the basis of who they are, have no place on Facebook. That's why we have a policy on dangerous individuals and organization, which states that we do not allow those who engage in offline organized hate to have a presence on Facebook. Well, they just described the fuzziest standard that I can imagine. And while I am no fan of hate speech or hate groups, I am an extremist about the First Amendment. And how do you de de define virulent hate speech from nasty hate speech from merely offensive hate speech? And how do human beings evaluate the intentions of text that is posted on a social media platform? This is a very dangerous path that we are on. And it all revolves around these claims of terrorism. And so today, Donald Trump gave one more election eve gift to Benjamin Netanyahu, who faces the voters in Israel tomorrow. Trump announced that he is designating the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran as a terrorist organization. Now, there are 11 million people connected to the Revolutionary Guard Corps. And Iran reacted by declaring that the Central Command of the United States, the part of the military that oversees operations in the Middle East, is a terrorist organization. Now, some of this is tit-for-tat, and it seems silly. But top Pentagon and CIA officials opposed Trump's decision. They argue it would allow hardline Iranian officials to justify deadly operations against Americans overseas. An interagency lawyers group concluded the designation was too broad, but Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and John Bolton, National Security Advisor, they won the day. Senior Iraqi officials are opposed to the new designation. It could impose travel limits and economic sanctions on some lawmakers in their government. And they are considering clamping down on the legal movements of some 5,000 American troops in Iraq. So this came a day before the general elections in Israel. And even the New York Times acknowledges this could give Netanyahu a boost in the final hours of his re-election campaign. This is collusion, friends. Trump is colluding with Netanyahu to get Netanyahu re-elected. You want a little proof? BB tweeted, Once again, you are keeping the world safe from Iran aggression and terrorism. Aimed at his buddy, the Donald. And Trita Parsi, the founder of the National Iranian American Council, emailed some comments. The unprecedented decision to designate the IRGC as a terrorist organization will not put any significant additional economic pressures on Iran. It will, however, have significant political implications. This move closes yet another potential door for peacefully resolving tensions with Iran. Once all doors are closed and diplomacy is rendered impossible, war will essentially become inevitable. This is hardly a coincidence, as the elements who have pushed for this dangerous decision have a long and public track record of pushing the U.S. toward war with Iran. And this comes just two days after Netanyahu in a television interview, or perhaps it was in a debate context, announced that he now supports annexation of illegal settlements on the West Bank. And that puts it on the ballot tomorrow. Will Israeli voters hold their noses and put this man who's accused of corruption and who's already had three consecutive terms as prime minister, will this pander enough to them to get him over the hump? And it's interesting to note the New York Times, a big Zionist supporter, writes, The incremental entrenchment of Jewish settlements on Palestinian land is often called creeping annexation. And they vaguely note that it's illegal. And the other point is that Netanyahu says that this is the next phase, suggesting that there is a master plan to push out the Palestinians to create one Jewish state 
and just leave the Palestinians to find their own way. So with the election, I don't know much about Benny Gantz. He's a very tall general, six foot foot five. He has promised to split a five-year term with another guy who's on his ticket. And Gantz has been kind of vague about his policies. He's basically just running as not Bibi or not King Bibi. <laughs> and here's a statement he made in his uh, a column that he published last week. Benny Gantz, quote, Netanyahu has done good things too, but after 13 years in power, he is working only for himself. He is up to his neck in investigations, indictments, in a discourse of hatred and incitement. The time has come to tell him, thank you, Bibi, enough. And here's a surprise, and I think a moment of political courage, where we see Beto O'Rourke, a Democratic candidate for president, who has been quite vague about what his policies would be, and in particular has not taken a position that I'm aware of on the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. Beto condemned Netanyahu for siding with a far-right racist party in order to maintain his hold on power, and he went further, commenting on how in 2015 Netanyahu pandered to Jewish voters by going racist and saying they had to turn out because Arab citizens of Israel were voting in higher-than-expected numbers. The U.S.-Israel relationship is one of the most important relationships that we have on the planet. And that relationship, if it is to be successful, must transcend partisanship in the United States, and it must be able to transcend a prime minister who is uh, racist, uh, as he warns about Arabs coming to the polls, who wants to defy any prospect for peace as he threatens to annex the West Bank, uh, and who has sided with a far-right racist party in order to maintain his hold on power. So that's a pretty strong statement. And I applaud Congressman, former Congressman O'Rourke, for making it. Now, here's the flip, uh, the flip coin, the flip side of the coin. Trump went to Sheldon Adelson, his biggest financial backer, a staunch supporter of the most extreme elements of Zionism, in Israel, and the event was held at one of Adelson's hotels in Las Vegas. And Trump went there, and first he attacked Representative Ilan Omar. Now, he didn't specifically claim that she had made anti-Semitic comments, but that work was done for him by Congressman Lee Zeldin of New York and Congressman Kevin McCarthy, the Republican minority leader in the House. And then Trump went on to use what everybody calls anti-Semitic tropes, the kind of comments that suggest that Jews in America have dual loyalties, something that explicitly was never expressed by Ilan Omar. And let me quote the New York Times. Trump also appeared to blur the lines between the American Jews in the audience and Israelis, referring at one point to Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel as your prime minister and warning that congressional Democrats could leave Israel out there all by yourselves. This is not the first time that Trump has made comments that, if uttered by a woman in a hijab, would be just denounced as anti-Semitic. This shows the double standard. How anti-Semitism is wielded as a weapon to silence critics of Israel and its policies. And I'm just disgusted by it. Now this occurred just a few hours after it was reported that Ilan Omar was the subject of a death threat issued by a big supporter of Trump named Patrick Carly Carlinio from Addison, New York. He was arrested Friday, charged with making a threatening phone call to Omar's office. According to the FBI, FBI, Carlinio told a staff member, Do you work for the Muslim Brotherhood? Why are you working for her? She's a fucking terrorist. I'll put a bullet in her fucking skull. And coming her to the defense of Omar, freshman congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, 
implied there was a causal link between Jeanette Pirro's comments on Fox News and the death threat against Omar. Understand, when Janine Pirro goes on Fox and rallies people to think hijabs are threatening, it leads to this. And I think she's right. Finally, I want to recommend a piece by Robert Mackey at The Intercept, who describes in detail what Trump said on Saturday and why it is so deeply offensive. Thanks for joining me for my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it all over the damn place, anywhere, everywhere, however you like. You'll find it on YouTube. And I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails